session and welcome everyone. Good afternoon, namaste. It's great to see so many of you uh, during this, this event. And um, I'm really happy that uh, my presentation today um, is actually complementary to what Greg said. So you will get a lot of information, a lot of expertise in terms of how to successfully deliver changes in organization, how to successfully transform your organizations. And I know that a lot of you are HR professionals, uh, organizational leaders, line managers, team leaders, and there is a lot that you can do in your role in order to improve the outcomes of various changes you run in your companies, in your organizations. In my presentation, I will focus on this question, why good changes fail. I guess that no one in this room would ever think about implementing bad changes in organizations, right? Everything we do, when we think about those improvements to the way we work, we think about making our organizations better, working more efficiently, bringing more income, making our um, customers and our employees happier, more satisfied with the way we do our business. And those good changes that we are introducing in our organizations, even though they are fantastic, even though we expect them to deliver a lot of value, very often then they fail. So what I would like to show you today are some strategies that we can implement in our companies, in our organizations, which will help us to improve the outcomes of the transformations and changes that we introduce. Um, I will specifically focus on the way that, that change portfolio management can play um, in that. But before we start, let me ask you one question. Despite your greatest effort, despite following all the processes and standards and checklists, have you ever been dissatisfied with the results of your work? Raise your hand, please, if you have ever been dissatisfied with the results of your work, even though you are following all the best standards. There are a lot of us. And I will tell you, we are not alone. Um, there is a lot of best practices that we can choose from, a lot of uh, organizational change management models and practices, but very often what happens, even though we follow them up to the point, like we, we go through the checklist one by one, still we get dissatisfied with the results. And what I realized during my cooperation with different organizations is that at the moment when we are defining our business case, which is the time when we are testing our idea. We are trying to establish whether what we want to implement will bring us the right return on investment. So when we have an idea, we need to test if our organization, we need to check if our organization is ready for that. We need to see how much money it will cost. And what we are talking about at this stage, when we talk about the business case, we are talking the value language. We are talking about the return on investment that we want to get by implementing certain processes, by uh, improving um, the way we deliver services to our clients. So we talk about lower attrition, we talk about less, less waste, lower costs. We want to deliver our work faster, be the first to the market with our new products. But then a very interesting thing happens. When we approve the business case and we know what we want to achieve, we start planning our project to deliver that value. And then we start talking the product language. We start talking about the new process, the new IT system, the new set of values, uh, new organizational culture, um, Centralization, this is the favorite word of Greg's. He loves centralizations, streamline, because those things, as you can see here, they are not yet the value. They are just the products that we design, which we hope that they will help us to deliver the value that we agreed at the business case stage. Business case stage. As you can see, there is a gap here between the product that we are designing 
and the value that we wanted to achieve when we were talking about that business case, right? What do you think that gap is? What is missing here? Any ideas? It's people, right? Even the best products, even the most efficient process, even the best in the world IT system will not help us, we not, will not deliver the value that we want to achieve if people will not know how to use it, why do we do it, um, what's the effort required with, uh, with, that, with following that process, if they don't know how to do it efficiently. So one of the key things um, about introducing changes in organizations is to not only focus on the product, not only focus on the package, the process, the system, but to make sure that people who will be impacted by this change are engaged in delivering that value. Only through people, through people engagement and supporting people on the change journey, we can deliver value to our organizations. And as HR professionals, you can play an extremely important role here because you might be leaders of some of the change projects. You might also be part of the change implementation team. And your expertise in this area and awareness that this is something that needs to happen is really one of the key factors which will help the organizations to deliver the value. So here, the organizational change management comes into play. Organizational change management is about preparing our organization, which means preparing the people who will be impacted by the change for the new processes, for the new structures, for the new systems. And when we talk about the OCM, the organizational change management, we talk about the process. There is a set of steps that we need to take in order to move from the place where we are now to our future state. We need to understand our change. We need to understand what impact this change will have on individuals. We need to plan our change management strategy, the training that will be required, all the support needed for our employees after the change goes live. It also includes all the actions that we will be taking. So we need to make sure that we have all those plans in place before we start the change. But I can say, um, I'm sure that you would say that in many cases, in many situations, the change has already happened, and now we can see that it doesn't work. We can't see the results. What is important to remember here is that even after the change was implemented and you might feel that it's not very successful, we can still go back and understand what are the actions that we need to take to support people, right? Because we are still, we need to still keep in mind the value. Even though the change has already, already been implemented and we haven't done the preparation, it doesn't mean that everything is lost, okay? And the third very important thing is competency. Change management is also a competency, which is very important in each and every role in the organization. Because you do not necessarily need to be organizational leader or a project manager. It's a competency that is required from many different roles in the organization. And I will tell you a little bit about the changing role of a project leader, of a project manager over the recent years, highlighting exactly, exactly that. So, Organizational change management is about focusing on people. It's about focusing on supporting people through the change journey. Without that, there is no way that we will achieve the value that we wanted to get by implementing these organizational changes. And very often I get a question, so if it's all about people and change management, what's the difference between change management and project management? Is it the same or is it completely different? So there is a very short definition that I, that I really like, which says that project management is about preparing a solution for an organization. So we are working on designing the right process, the right system, the right organizational structures. And change management is about preparing organization for that solution that we are bringing. 
you can see that if you look at it, it's not possible to successfully deliver change in organization if we only say we are preparing the solution. If people don't use it, we won't see the value. We need to make sure that whenever we are implementing something new, we follow that integrated approach. So we combine the technical project management skills with the organizational management with the focus on people. So this is the full picture again. As you can see, the business case, that's when we talk about value, we agree what we want to achieve, we know what's our uh, final objective, and then we design the product that will help us to get there, but without people, we won't be able to, to achieve that. So this is the key focus that we need to keep in mind. And I mentioned that I will tell you a little bit about the changing role of a project manager. So you can see now on this picture that the project manager's role is not only about delivering the package, delivering the product. Um, however, it used to be like that. Um, in the project management area, in the project man management industry, for a long time, we were focusing on delivering uh, the product according to the specification that was agreed, making sure that everything was delivered within the budget, uh, making sure that it's delivered according to the agreed timeline, we had the proper um, date for a go-live when everything needs to be ready, and of course, everything had to be delivered um, according to the, to the right standard, uh, standards ensuring the high quality. But now, it's not only about the product. Not, now what we are looking at is to making sure that the value and the return on investment is delivered. Project management, project managers, play a very important role here. Uh, apart from designing and creating the product, we also need to understand who will be impacted by this change who will need to use this product in order to help the organization to get that return on investment. So coming back to the previous um, definition about the differences between project management and change management, now the change manager's role is much wider, right? And sometimes you will see that the project manager works with a change manager. If the changes are more complex, they are bigger, they are more challenging, it makes sense to have a dedicated person who will, who will support project manager with this whole process. However, as I mentioned before, it's also about building competency. So as project leaders, as HR professionals as well in the project roles, because sometimes, or maybe you have already played those roles, you will need to understand that and build and develop that competency to support those impacted by change to adopt it. And there is one more role, um, which is the project or change sponsor. This is the person who is, at the end of the day, responsible for making sure that the value, that the return on investment is delivered. So in your roles, in the HR professional roles, in the team leader roles, um, as Greg mentioned in his presentation, sometimes you might be assigned the role of a sponsor. But in some cases, this might not be the right assignment. So you also need to be aware of that and then point out that maybe I can be the project leader, I can support delivery of that organizational value, but within the HR scope, I can't be the owner of the value, right? But without understanding how this works, it would be very difficult to make sure that there is the right sponsor in place for your transformation initiatives. When we talk about the best practices and some of the key actions and strategies that are being taken when we deliver um, organizational changes, there is, a, there is a set of those which are quite typical. When we manage organizational change, we talk about building desire to participate in change. Of course, we need to make sure that people understand why we do it and the future state is attractive. Because otherwise, why do we need to change? And it, it's not only about talking about what is desirable, what is attractive for the organization, but we also need to think about what is it for me from the perspective of the people who are impacted by this change, right? How do we build that desire within the employees who need to change their behaviors? 
we also talk about creating a sense of urgency. This is something, this is also one of the things that Greg mentioned. We need to create within our organizations that sense of urgency to change. If we have that feeling that we still have time, we can wait a couple of years. It might not be the wisest idea because other organizations, other companies will introduce the products to the market sooner. Communicating the why. Of course, we need to know why we need to change, why we are introducing new processes, new systems, why do we putting all that extra effort on top of our business as usual in order to introduce something new in our company. We want to build compelling vision of the future, again, to build that desire to participate in change. We want to solidify those changes with short-term wins. If we have long transformations, very complex ones, and if we tell people that um, the first results and the successes will be seen in two years' time, it wouldn't build that uh, excitement about the change. We have, and our human, human nature is that we want to see the results of our work as soon as possible, and those doesn't need to be big things, not the final value. We need the time to build the value that we wanted to achieve. But we need to have, we need to identify those short-term wins that we can share with our audiences, with the people who are impacted by change, and especially if we are introducing changes in a phased approach. Because if we introduce it in one, in one department, we show people that it worked, that it actually made their work faster, easier, it will be easier to bring that change to the future, to the next department, next functions. Line manager support. This is extremely important. In a role of a project manager or a project sponsor um, or being part of the project management team, it's very difficult, if not impossible, to be able to support all those different teams and individuals. We just don't have the bandwidth. We don't know those teams very well. That's why we need to make sure that after we identify who will be impacted by the change, we need to make sure that we involve, that we engage the line managers. They are our most valuable change agents especially when it comes to the changes affecting behavior, to the changes which affect our organizational culture, and bigger changes. The more, the better engaged are the line managers, the less resistance and the easier it will be for us to deliver those changes. We need to create effective action plan. We need to make sure that we have the right people within the change management team. Um, and one important thing which I would like to uh, mention about the, the change management team, very often when I ask the question, how should your change management team, who should your change management team consist of? Who are the people who should lead the change within the organization? So very often people say, well, we need people who love change. We need people who are extroverted, very passionate, energetic. Uh, they need to have very positive approach. They need to be uh, fun-loving, sociable. But if you think about it, if our change management team only consists of people who love change, they will design the change journey for people who love change, right? And most of us, don't feel very comfortable when a change is introduced. We don't necessarily like changes. So it's wise to make sure that within your change management team, you have people from different backgrounds, from different teams with different personalities. Also those who don't necessarily like change. Also those who resist change. Because resistance to change is not something negative. We perceive it as something negative because it doesn't help us to deliver changes. It can make the changes to take more time, to be more difficult. But it's a signal of something. It tells us that maybe the solution that we design will not work in certain circumstances. Maybe the overall idea is great and we buy it, and the value that we want to achieve is great. But maybe in our economy, in our organizational culture, in our country, the solution that was designed will not bring that value. So we need to listen to the resistance, right? 
And those are the typical elements that we talk about when we discuss managing change. But even though we follow those best practices and just do them one by one, make sure that we have the right team, we create that sense of urgency, we identify the short-term term wins, we share them with the organization, we have a very compelling vision of the future, even if we do everything, we still will face, we will still face resistance to change. And when we talk about resistance, very often we associate that with negative changes. Um, if there are some layoffs in the organization, of course there will, there will be resistance. If we are replacing the current system that people are used to with something completely new, and especially if they were not involved earlier in the decision-making process, in the consultations, you will face resistance. Uh, if we are streamlining processes because we realize that, that in each and every department of our organization, people follow slightly different process and we want to make it faster, there will be resistance because everyone feels that my process is the best one in the world. Um, so the resistance to change is something that you should expect. It's absolutely normal. And what is important to remember is that resistance to change is not only connected with the negative change. We might uh, come across very positive changes like promotions, salary increase. Um, let's imagine that you were just, uh, you, you just got a promotion, the, the promotion you are waiting for a long time. It comes with a salary increase, with a bigger office, you will have a larger team, you will be serving clients from different industries, there will be a bigger, um, bigger number of clients, you will, there will be some interesting projects that you can be involved in. And at the beginning, you might feel that excitement, you feel happy, you are uh, impressed with what you achieved and you really want to start working in that new role as soon as possible. But then, after a while, you will start thinking, will I manage all of that? It's a bigger team, more clients, more complaints. Um, with the increased salary, there, there comes increased scope of my work. Will I get any support? Um, also, how will this change affect my relationships with other people, with other, with maybe with those who are also waiting for that promotion? I was the one who was chosen to do this role, right? So the resistance also comes when we talk about positive changes, changes that we label as good. We need to think about, when we talk about that change resistance, we need to remember that there are at least two perspectives that we can look at. Resistance to change is a state, which means the way we feel, the, w the, the, the way we behave, we feel when we uh, experience some kind of a change in our life, in our work. But it's also something that we call individual disposition, which is very much connected with our personality. And just like with any other personality trait, we have different dispositions to experience resistance to change. It's a scale, basically. So we will, be, we will have those who are lower on the scale. We have those who will be, well, more in the middle and more towards the higher spectrum on the scale. And I'm sure that you can identify within your teams, within your departments, people who, when the change is announced, are already against. They don't like it. The moment they hear next change comes, they will, be, they will feel that resistance to, to these new things that are going to be introduced. And there will be those people who, when they hear that there is change coming, they are okay with just hearing that there is a new direction, there is just a strategy, uh, maybe there is not that much information to be shared, but they feel comfortable with that. They just wait for more information to be shared as soon as they are available. So it's, remember to, to, uh, it's important to remember that there are those two perspectives. Um, and in terms of those individual dispositions, 
and our personality. And actually, I will, I will share with you some, uh, some results of the research I did in the area of organizational, uh, of the resistance to change in personality. But what is important to remember here is that personality, well, there are different sources of resistance that we can think of. There is a lot, we could have a very long discussion about the resistance to change. But there are some buckets of things, of sources, which cause resistance. And first of them is fear. When the change is announced, we are afraid of losing something very important to us. Um, before the change, we are in our comfort zone, which we know is very safe, very nice, we enjoy being there, we know it inside out, no surprises. But when we hear that there, there will be a change introduced in our organization, we are afraid. We are afraid because we know that this change will come with extra effort required from us. Maybe we will need to lo work longer hours for some time. Uh, the processes that we need to follow will be more difficult when we start doing them for the first time. And the, the biggest fear, which might come as well, is from losing our authority. Imagine the situation that now you are informed about a change to the core process that you follow. And imagine that up until now, you were the expert in that process. You were the person to whom your colleagues were coming to get answers. They were coming to you to ask questions, to ask for advice, to say that, well, I don't know how to do it correctly, can you help me? And now, this process changes completely. You are in the situation when you are the one who will need to get the answers. You will have a lot of questions. Maybe there is not even anyone in the organization who can give those questions, or maybe there is someone external coming in with the whole set of procedures, processes, and suddenly they become an expert. So, what we feel very often in this situation is that fear of losing our authority, right? Because up until now, we were the experts. Now the change comes, we are losing that. And when it starts getting really um, stressful for people is when they build their power within the organization on that knowledge, on that expertise. Those are the people who will be resistant the most because they will basically lose a part of their identity within the company. So we really, really need to think about that when we introduce those changes, understanding what are the sources of the resistance. The second one is the history of change. The history of change, which is our previous experiences with changes in the organization. And each and every one of us, we have different experiences with changes. Uh, but overall, if we say that our experience with transformations in our companies is negative, because there was a lot of chaos, there was a lot of work, we didn't see the results, when the new change is introduced or is announced, straight away we feel resistant. Because we know that in the past, the changes were only something difficult, creating chaos, we didn't know what to do, what to expect, there was a huge impact, we didn't have anyone who led those changes, so there was no one to ask all the questions and raise the concerns. So our beliefs and our previous history with change is extremely important. And now in your role, in the role of HR professionals, team leaders, organizational leaders, we can't change the history. What has happened, it's done. But the good thing is that we can create a new history. Each and every day, we create those experiences for our team. The way we deliver organizational changes today will hugely impact how people will react to changes that will come tomorrow. And the changes are constant. I'm sure you can tell there is no stop, there is no break from changes. So, okay, what was in the past, it happened, but let's focus on the present because today we are creating that history for our organizations, for our employees. There is also another source of resistance, which is our beliefs. 
And this is connected with the history of change. If we believe that this particular change will take more from us than it will take in return, we will resist. So it's extremely important to, when we communicate changes, make sure that we highlight the benefits, but not for the organization. This is something that we need to do anyway. But our teams and the people who are impacted by change, they want to know what's in it for me, not for the organization. This is something that will be on the billboards and posters anyway, but what's in it for me as the employee impacted by change? There is also our personality, individual differences, and we talked a little bit about that. And if you look at those bubbles here, the fear, the history of change, the beliefs, these are all the items that we can somehow influence. But in terms of individual differences, there is no good or bad here. We are just different. We react to change differently. So we just need to adjust the approach of managing change to those individual differences, right? But there is one more thing, and it's crucial for my presentation today. There is one more thing that is one of the key sources of resistance to change, which we very often forget about. And this additional element is change saturation. Change saturation, which is the amount of change happening in our organization at the same time. Very often, we can uh, see that our teams resist changes because there is just too much change happening. It's not that this change that we are implementing is bad, is negative, that it will not bring us um, any benefits. It might be a very positive change, which is going to make our work easier, um, which is going to positively impact us as individuals. But because it's yet another change, we just don't have the bandwidth. Each and every change, change comes with an effort, right? There is no way to have easy, nice, shiny, and happy change all the time. No way. It's difficult. We need to unlearn certain things and learn new things and practice if we want to do it right. So we really need to be mindful and think about the amount of changes happening in our organization because they might affect and they will affect the results, the outcomes of our work. Let's imagine a situation where in our organization we are implementing a change. We are introducing a new performance management system and the impacted team is the HR department. Of course, the HR team needs to understand how to use the new performance management system because maybe they will be the ones who will be introducing that to the line managers. So, we are starting this change, we are introducing this new system in March. So, probably what we need to do is we need to work with the HR team to prepare them for that change, do some training, make, create, uh, design some workshops, work together on the specification of the new solution. So we start that, let's say, in the mid middle of January. Then we go live with the system, the HR team starts using it. So there probably in March will be some extra effort required from the HR department to use the tool to learn how to do it properly when it's live. But then, there is another change announced. In May, we are introducing new organizational structures. Again, this is the change that heavily impacts the HR department because this is the team that will need to support creating those new charts, making sure all the documents are updated. So again, we start this change a little bit earlier, we make sure that we are prepared, we go through, together through, um, through all the processes that needs to be followed, and then after the go live, in May, there is still some extra effort required with this change. But then, actually, from January, we introduced new organizational culture. So it's yet another change happening, and when we talk about organizational culture, you can tell that the HR department is one of the most heavily involved in that. What happens in March? Uh, chaos, yes, yes. For it, and this is just three changes. I'm sure that you are going through many more at the same time. So if you look at it this way, you can see 
that probably introducing yet another change in this organization, and especially for this department, is not the wisest idea, right? Um, so you can see that even though we don't look at any other sources of resistance, if you only look at the timeline and effort required from the, those changes, that's enough to say the resistance will come. And when people resist change, they are not engaged, they are not taking part in the change, they are not adopting the change, or the adoption rate is much slower. So you can tell that achieving our outcomes, achieving the value that we wanted to get, coming back to that picture with the business case and the package, we will not get there. We need to make sure that when introducing organizational changes and transformation, we address that resistance to change. As Greg said, we don't fight it, we don't uh, reduce it completely, we can't get rid of resistance because it's a very natural reaction, but we need to work on, use our strategies and ways to minimize the resistance to change. And one of the things that we can do is to, first of all, understand what are the changes happening in our organization and have a visibility of that. And that's when we can start, well, actually, the factors, yes, the factors, what, can, what, can, what else can influence the level of resistance to change? Overall, the, um, the, the change saturation, this is what I, what I just showed you, the level of change saturation is one of the environmental factors. We have many more. We can talk about the communication, the trust in senior leadership, the team leader support, the change history, and also the change saturation. Those are all the elements, these are all the factors that we can influence. And I will show you in a moment how can we address the resistance to change coming from the change saturation. We also have those individual differences I told you about, and I just would like to uh, take a few minutes to talk to you about the research I did, because it's also quite, quite interesting one and important when we talk about resistance. Because there are, even though, again, you will follow all the best practices, and even if, even if you address all those environmental factors, including change saturation, there are also some personality traits which will make it difficult for people anyway. And I just want to highlight that, because very often people get um, demotivated when they follow all the practices and everything, all the processes, but it doesn't work. Sometimes, and especially for people who um, are high on, those on, those, um, high on the scale of tolerance of ambiguity, openness to experience, extraversion and agreeableness, um, I, will, I will go through them one by one and will tell you how it works when it comes to resistance. Um, so, in the research I did, I wanted to understand what is the correlation between the environmental factors, so those we can, we can influence, the first four, so it was effective communication, trust in senior leadership, team leader support, and change history, resistance to change, and those individual differences factors. And based on the results of my research, we can tell that those individual differences play even more important role in the level of resistance to change. For example, tolerance of ambiguity. Tolerance of ambiguity tells us whether a person um, feels comfortable, more comfortable, less comfortable in changing chaotic uh, situations. And as you can tell, change very often is chaotic. So people who are high on the scale of tolerance of ambiguity, they feel more comfortable with the change. Those who are lower, no, they need to have a plan. They need to know what will happen tomorrow, next week, next month. Openness to experience. People who are high on the openness to experience scale, they enjoy new things, they enjoy new ideas, they enjoy new situations, so for them, the change will be easier. People who are extroverted, who are fun-loving, sociable, they enjoy interactions, again, for them, the change will be a little bit easier than for the other ones and agreeableness. People who are um, more agreeable, people who don't like conflict, they normally experience lower level of resistance to change. But again, all those 
individual factors. This is something that we don't influence. We don't change our personalities. We don't work on that delivering changes in organizations. But we need to be aware of those individual differences because even though we follow the best practices and we uh, address the change saturation, I will show you in a moment how to do it, we might not get 100% of results that we wanted to achieve. So I just wanted to make sure that you are aware of that. Don't be too hard on yourself. We need to support people, but very often you won't be able to completely reduce the resistance. But now, the change saturation. Here's when the change portfolio management comes into play. Very often in organizations, we have um, well-established portfolio management, project portfolio management. We know how many projects are happening, who is delivering those projects. We know that there are certain people involved. We know what's the budget. We know what are the resources. But we don't necessarily look at the effort required from people to change. So by introducing the change portfolio management, which is basically about looking at the effort required from people who need to change their ways of working, we are able to see where are those areas that will be impacted the most, and then we can look how can we adjust our projects in order to increase the outcomes, to increase the value that we are delivering. Because one of the key aspects, one of the key factors in delivering value is working with that resistance. That's why I took some time to really go through that resistance and where does it come from, how does it work? Because change portfolio management is how we can address it on the organizational level. We can look what's the change landscape for our teams, for our organizations. But the question is, how can we measure that level of change saturation? We know what to do, but how can we do it? And there is a tool that I very often use when introducing changes when working with my clients. It's the most important tool that we use uh, for organization or in organizational change management. And this tool is called the Change Impact Assessment, also known as CIA. So it's easy to remember that tool. And it basically helps us to understand what is the level of effort required to change our behaviors, to adopt the new, um, to, to adopt the changes. So here, when we talk about the change impact assessment, we are not talking about the impact overall for the organization, but for the individuals who will need to change. So when I showed you that um, graph, that timeline with the changes that will be affecting the HR department, we are talking about the HR people. The, hate, the, the members of the HR department, what is the effort we required from them to adopt all those different changes? And how does the change impact assessment look like? Well, we need to ask ourselves a set of questions. First of all, who will be impacted by this change? Who are our stakeholders who will need to change their ways of working? That's one of the key things that we need to establish. The second thing is that what are the areas in which that change will occur? So basically, what is changing for us? We will have different areas for different stakeholders across the organization, but first of all, let's think about overall what those areas can be. We can introduce changes to the tools that we use to the IT systems, to the tools that are used in the factories, to different types of tools that we use in our everyday work. Our organizational structures might change because, for example, we are merging organizations. So probably the leadership team will look differently, the team structures will be different. If we are changing our organizational strategy, we also change our objectives. And if we change our strategic objectives, we change the KPIs. We change how we measure the outcomes. We change organizational cultures. This one is the most difficult change because um, when I talk about the difficulty of changes, the more the results are dependent on people, the more difficult the change will be. So the, as you can see, the organizational culture, that would be a whole complex change. 
the processes that we follow might change. We might introduce new ones, we might streamline the current ones. And the compensation, sometimes the, the structure of, of compensation of salaries in, your, in the organization also changes. And what is important to remember here is that even one group of stakeholders might be impacted in different, in few different areas, not only one. So it's important to identify that. Once we go through that, once we know who will be impacted and what are the areas of impact, we should ask ourselves a question, what is our current state in those areas? So if we introduce a new system, how does it look now for our stakeholders? How do they, what are the processes that they, are currently, that they currently follow? And very often, you will not be the right person to do it because you are not within that team, so you will not have all that information. So what is important here is to make sure that you identify those stakeholder representatives from the different teams and you work with them because they will give you those details, but they need to be engaged. The next question is, what is our future state? So once we understand where we are now, after introducing the new system, new procedure, how will the future look like? And describe it as much as you can. The more details you will put there, the better. And why? Because by that, you can answer the next question, which is extremely important for planning delivery of the change. What do we need to successfully move from our current state to the future state. You can say, you can tell that without that, without identifying the current state and future state, it would be extremely difficult to tell what do we need? What do we need to do to change? And there is one more question which is worth to ask, and it's about the timing. When this change will be delivered? And it's not only because we need to create the plan, it's also because the moment when we want to implement this change might not be the right at all, because maybe it's the time when we, within the organization, are so focused on delivering services to our customers that introducing change at that time will be uh, definitely something that, would, that would, will make this change to fail, because people will be involved in something, something completely different. And this is, don't be scared by so much text, it's just an example. I wanted to show you how a sample change, uh, imp change impact assessment can look like. It's just an example. And you can see it's not very fancy. It doesn't need to be a fancy tool that you will, you will use, a uh, new, uh, extremely complex IT system. It can be just a simple table. And actually, for smaller changes, you don't need to have a table at all. It's more about discussing, it's more about conversation with the teams who are impacted by change to understand what is required, what, what impact it will have on, on them so we can identify the actions that should be taken to support them on the change journey. And this tool is a direct input to our change saturation heat map, which I will show you in a moment. I just want to highlight um, how important this tool is in introducing organizational changes. On one hand, it will help you with a single change. So when you have a change you are introducing, you can use this tool to assess the impact and to plan based on the outcome of this exercise, what are the steps that you need to take to support your team. But also, there is a great thing that can happen if you use this tool as a standard within your organization. If you implement change impact assessment across your projects and you follow the same process for all your initiatives, you will understand what is the level of impact for each of those projects and you can put them on a timeline. Impact on, on, on the impacted employees. So as I mentioned earlier, it, there is a difference between the impact on the project team that is implementing uh, the, the new initiative. But this one is about the impact on the employees who need to change the way they work, right? And this is extremely important to, um, to remember. So how can that change saturation heat map look like? It can look like this. 
you can have your different departments, different functions, different teams. And then we have the timeline. Here is between January and April. And you can see that, uh, for example, April for your organization looks pretty tough. Probably it would not be very wise to introduce more changes in April because, again, you will find um, you, you, will, you will experience a lot of resistance from those teams and also the outcomes of your changes, the value that you wanted to deliver will probably not be achieved or at least not that fast. Um, for team, uh, for department three, you can see that for them, the beginning of the year starts very, in a very difficult way, right? January, February, May, March, April. Each and every month there is a change happening and the impact is either medium or high, right? Doing anything within that team, introducing new things, it's extremely um, risky. We also need to remember that what we can see here on this heat map is just the changes. It's not the business as usual that they need to do, right? Every change that we introduce in the organization comes with additional effort. Also, only by seeing how this uh, effort looks like across the organization, only then we can make decisions, right? It's not that um, after, in, uh, after going through that change impact assessment exercise and looking at the change saturation across the organization, it doesn't say that, oh gosh, there is too much work, there is too much change, we don't do any, uh, anything else. It's more about understanding that if we want to introduce something new, it will come with a certain level of risk. So it's more like a support to decision making, and I think within HR, you are in a great role to suggest having something like this. Because if you look at it, if there is resistance within organization, if we can't be delivering our outcomes, the value that we want to achieve via our initiatives, this might impact all the other HR areas, right? People will be burned out. I know that you probably had that panel discussion about stress and burnout in organizations. Very often, one of the key components, the sources of the burnout, is too much change. If we don't look at the changes happening in our organization from the change portfolio perspective, it will be very difficult to um, implement those other things that you are doing to reduce the, le the risk of burnout and the level of stress with the organization. Change comes with a certain level of stress, right? And the question which often gets asked is, when should we do it? How does it look like when we look at the change implementation process? So just quickly going through the process of implementing organizational change. What we do at the beginning is, first of all, we need to define the change. What is happening, when it will happen, who will be impacted? And we agree on the strategy. Then we plan the management of the change, we create the resistance uh, management plan, we create the communication plan, then we prepare the organization for the solution, then we have the go life, right, the change is implemented, and of course we need to ensure that the change is sustainable, right? It's not only after the go life very often we go on vacation, but it's not the end. We start the adoption after the go life. And when it comes to developing the change uh, port portfolio management, to the, the, the defining our change heat map and assessing the impact that those changes will have, it happens very early on, at the very beginning. When we know what the change is about, when we have identified our stakeholders who will be impacted, that's the moment for us to assess the level of impact by involving the line managers, by involving those who will be impacted by this change. So this is really important. It's one of the first steps. And just to come back for a moment to, to this picture, as you can see, in order to achieve the value that we wanted to get when we were discussing our business case, when we were discussing the budget that we want to put on that initiative and the resources, we need people. The product itself will not deliver value. 
And one of the key things to do is to understand where the resistance to change is coming from. Because the, highest lev the higher the level of resistance, the lower the chances that we will be able to, address, to, to achieve the value. One of the key things that will help us to, address, to understand and to address the level of resistance is to implement the change portfolio management is to make sure that we identify, that we assess the level of impact and that we look at it from the organizational level. So I would like to highly encourage you to, when you start working on the new change, on the new initiative, to really think about what impact it will have on the identified stakeholders and what's the level of effort that, would be, that will be required from them. Very often we focus on the project team but we need to focus on those impacted by this change. And if you do it, if you start implementing this, well, first of all, you will be one of the pioneers, because I know that not many organization, organizations have yet implemented this approach, but also you will see that the value, that you will, you will start getting more and more value from your initiatives. So just to summarize the key takeaways from uh, my today's presentation. First of all, value delivery requires people engagement, both on the project side, of course, but specifically from those who are impacted by the change. Even if you have the best product, the best service in the world, if people are not engaged, if they don't understand a why, if they don't know how to do it, you will not be able to deliver the value. That's why it's so important to ensure the integration between project management and change management. And I would like you to think about the change management as a competency that you can develop and you should develop if you really want to be the leader of the future. And also for project managers, this is one of the competencies that should be developed in order to become the project manager focused on value, on truly delivering value in organization. The higher the change saturation, the higher the resistance to change can be. And the higher the resistance to change, the lower the chances that you will receive, that you will achieve your project outcomes. So critical here is to measure, measure the level of change saturation in your organization, in your team, and adjust your change management strategies accordingly which sometimes might mean that we need to slightly adjust the timeline of those changes. By introducing the standard way of assessing the change impact, you can create that change saturation heat map I showed you. Uh, there might be some tools available, you can use those, but if you are just starting, the simplest things is just to identify your stakeholders, sit down and have a discussion. If you are starting, if you just want to see that it works, do it this way. The easiest solutions are the better. And finally, by developing your competencies in organizational change management, in change leadership, you are not only investing in your own growth and development today, and you are not only investing in the success of your projects today, but you are also investing in your future success. Changes will be with us always. The moment we stop changing, we will lose our business. We need to keep adjusting. So I truly, I really would like to encourage you to read about it, learn it, practice, uh, because again, you can go very fancy way and try to do it um, following like a big bank approach and try to introduce fancy processes and systems. But the true power lies in, those, in our everyday actions. So try small, and I'm sure that if you follow this approach, if you start measuring the change saturation and the change impact, you will see that the value that you are bringing to the organization will only grow. So thank you very much uh, for, uh, for today, for all your, for your attention. Uh, 22 seconds left. Good. <laughs> Organizations. Do you use change impact assessment? Is it something that you, that you do? No? No, very, very rarely. I know that 
when we introduce changes, very often we look at the impact for the organization, right? And this is something what we do at the business case stage. We want to see how much this change will destabilize our organization, right? Can we afford that? What's the impact on the budget? But very, very rarely we still look at, at the people aspect. Yeah, thank you very much for the session. Uh, I, I was also a catalyst for changes in my organizations in the various uh, aspect. Uh, I just departments of the organizations at once. Mm -hmm. At that time, these departments are interlinked and they are interdependent as well. So when you show the slides uh, where the only three changes yes. can make the chaos, in that situation ah. when we need to have organization development as, at once and every department need to change something and they mm -hmm. are interrelated, how to manage that thing? Mm -hmm. Thank you very much for this question. This is an excellent question. Um, the first step is to have visibility to all those changes because very often what happens is that we are introducing new changes, those organization-wide, smaller ones, but we don't coordinate them, right? And we have limited resources, people who can manage the change, budgets, tools, and of course the bandwidth of the people is also limited, right? So the first step is to understand the landscape, right? So again, change portfolio management, impact assessment. Once we have that and we can see that there are those dif different changes overlapping, what is crucial is to understand what are the priorities for the organization, right? So here, the role of a change sponsor and senior leadership is really crucial. Because very often on, the, on our project management roles, we are unable to make that decision. We might not know what are the organizational strategic priorities. So that also shows how much the portfolio management um, is important for companies, right? Because if we don't see what are those changes when they are happening, it's very difficult to make that decision, but introducing that and then prioritizing. Um, and that means very often that some changes would need to be stopped. Um, one of those changes that will need to happen anyway, and are changes happening, are changes which are um, influenced by the, by the external environment from the organization. For example, there is a new law introduced and we have to, we have to follow. There are no questions asked whether we are uh, having little or a lot of changes within the organization. We might need to stop some initiatives because if we don't comply with the new law regulations, we won't be able to function right on the market. So um, I know that is quite a long answer to your question, but assessing what's the change saturation, what are the different changes happening at the same time within the organization, and then um, understanding what are the priorities, what, what, where can we get more, more value. Hope that answers your question. <laughs> Thank you. So I will stay around for some time, so please don't be shy to come over and say hi. And I would like to wish you the wonderful rest of your event. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Ms. Uh, Viola. Uh, I request you to please be here and thank you for simplifying the topic and explaining it so well to our audience. A big round thank of you. applause one more time. Thank you. Uh, let's have thank Ms. Uh, Samjana, ma'am, on stage, please, to give away the token of appreciation on behalf of Growth Seller. <laughs>